Well, come on, everybody. It's lovely and sunny again, isn't it? Which is a real blessing, because you know when we get to the notices, I'll be telling you that we're down the park later if you can make it. So I hope you brought me some some screen or some tan lotion or whatever, <coughs> and a hat or something, because it'll be warm down there. But welcome to our family service this morning. We've got communion this morning. Um, just a verse to start with. And <clears throat> this is relevant for what I want to talk about later. But this is Acts chapter 2. So this is the day the Holy Spirit came, the, ch- the day the Church of Christ came into being. And this is what it says about that first church there in Jerusalem. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, we'll share communion this morning, and to prayer. Now we're going to sing our first hymn together. And during that hymn, we're going to have a collection. Um, if you're not prepared for it, don't worry about it, just pass it on. But the money this morning will all go to the Derby City Mission and the great work that they do in our city. But we're going to start with a, a grand old hymn that Jeff actually chose, maybe not the last time he spoke, but the one before, something like that. But it's the Church's One Foundation. So I do want to talk about the Church today and for the next few weeks. So I'll swap to the piano. Buff and Anne are going to come up and help us to sing. There are a few missing the course with it being the park today, so stretch your legs, fill your your lungs, and raise your voices as we sing this old hymn, The Church's One Foundation.
for the offering and our time together this morning, and then we'll open up for prayers. Holy Father, three in one, we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning through the precious blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, through the work that he has completed for us. We have this blessed communion together with each other as a body of Christ and with our brothers and sisters in the world today and those who are already, Lord Jesus, at home with you. And Lord Jesus, it was your prayer that we would be one. It was your prayer that we would be so united together and experience that wonderful, loving, perfect oneness that you experienced with your Father and with the Holy Spirit. We pray your blessing on us today. We thank you for this offering that we've been able to take. We thank you for the Derby City Mission and all that they do in our city in seeking to help those who are in great need, whether in poverty or in, in debt, whether they're struggling with mental health or whatever it is. We thank you for their practical care, but we thank you that it's based in your love to seek to bring them to you and to help them to find faith and peace with you. Bless them, we pray. Bless us this morning as we gather together for your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, open prayer time. Obviously we'll be praying for those that are down the park already and are going to join later. But. Um, please can we carry on praying for Luke um, and Samuel and Lizzie mm -hmm. and all the others doing their GCSEs. I talked to mums this week and we've all found it very difficult. The momentum has been stopped by our turn. I'm sure the kids have been absolutely fine with that. Um, but perhaps to pray for them that their brains will do what they need to do tomorrow. Mostly that they will be drawn to God in it and that their parents won't drive them around to Brilliant, thank you. Did I see your hand up, Gray? Yes. In India, um, there seems to be a movement with the Hindus <coughs> uh, going out to Christians, removing them from their houses, driving them away from their homes completely, burning their houses. And uh, we've received an appeal. But just imagine that's just happened to one of us. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible experience for them. So uh, we feel moved to send a donation to the mission that's called Mission India that's photographed this to us. Um, uh, could we pray for those desperate people in a desperate situation? Yeah, thanks. And to see your hand, Nick? Yeah, we went to see Rita on Friday and uh, she was a big improvement in her area. Oh, she's too much. Her faculties were a lot better, you know, and uh, <coughs> she seemed a lot brighter. Anyway, she gives all the church her regards. So yeah, um, Wonderful. Thanks for that, mate. That's really great. And Ted? Uh, India again, in a terrible yeah. railway crash. Um, two or three hundred killed, um, mm. two thousand injured, and um, a terrible thing. And of course, there's a fire in it as well. Yeah. Two trains carrying two thousand people. That's India, isn't it? Every day. Yeah. I doubt there was a seat for everybody, was there? That's really yeah. devastating. Yeah. Pray for the folks who family <coughs> yeah. and the workers. So. Yeah. And I saw Jeff's hand up. No, it was the same thing as Tanya. It was the same thing. Yeah. So I've got two of them all over there. Dennis. Could we pray for Julian, please? His mental health and his family today. He was not able to join us. I was against Daisy. Thanks, Dennis. And Colin, oh, I've yeah. got a job today. Yeah, the Ukraine situation. <coughs> it's going on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Right. I don't always feel I need to say it, but I will this morning. If I forget what you asked for, nothing against you. <laughs> but we do believe in the presence of God, don't we? He bends down his ear to hear our prayers, which is wonderful, isn't it? So. Settle in shame. Right, let's just bow our heads and hearts and we'll pray together. Loving Father, what a wonderful thing it is that we 
are welcome into your presence, that we can come boldly and find help and grace in our time of need. But we know it was such a cost to come because it cost the precious blood and the lifeblood of our Lord Jesus as we will remember in a few moments in communion. But you do bend down your ear to hear our prayers, the silent <coughs> prayers of our hearts. When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays in us according to your will and purpose. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit's help who takes our prayers. And Lord Jesus, for you in heaven, who even now is in heaven at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. And you know our needs, whether they are close to home, in our hearts, for our families and our friends, or whether they are more worldwide. We thought of the wider world, of Ukraine, of this train crash in India. And we know that you tell us that the creation is groaning, waiting, Lord Jesus, for you to come back and to put things right as they were in the beginning, and even more blessed than that. And we pray for these people who have lost lives, who are struggling with disaster, famine, war, and the effect it has on so many families. And we pray for them in their loss, in their mourning. We pray that somewhere in that they would find peace and comfort and a path to you. <coughs> I know, Lord Jesus, you suffered for us, and suffering is something that we are not immune to in this life. But in you, we can find peace and strength and purpose in our suffering in a mysterious way. Pray your blessing on these people. Pray for these Christians that Graham has told us about in India who are being persecuted. We know that living our faith is not easy in a Western culture with all of its ways and excesses and beliefs and things that it does but we don't experience persecution to be thrown out in in the severe way that Graham's heard about and we just pray for them there are brothers and sisters we have brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering all sorts of things and don't have the comforts of life of this life that we have draw them close to you let them know your presence let them know your protection and encourage them and build them up we pray in the faith we pray for our families. We've got um, young people who are going through exams. Think of, particularly, of course, of Sam and of Lizzie and of Luke in the middle of their GCSEs. We pray that they will have enjoyed their break. It will give them the, the strength now and the determination to finish in the next two weeks or so the exams and the revision that they need to do. We pray for those families who have young people going through this and we pray that you will draw them close to you, help them to rely on you, help them to know your presence and blessing in it we ask. We thank you for, for Mick and Anne, we thank you they've been able to see Rita many years of course since she's been able to come and join us here. We thank you they found her in good spirits and we thank you they were able to share with her. We pray that today she would know your presence with her and she would know communion with you in a way that she can't while she's here but still have that sweet communion that we sang about. So Lord Jesus, we just come to you now as we prepare our hearts, as we come to your word, as we come to your table. We pray that you will draw close to us and bless us. We ask it in your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, notices. I already know I've missed one notice, but I'll correct that as I go through. So today, um, Andy and a few people are already down at Chad Park, and that started... Well, it's set up, but people are allowed in, I think, at 11. We're going to do around 5, depending on how busy it is. It's a beautiful day, so hopefully it'll be busy. Um, and there'll be lots of people who we can tell about our little church, about the children's work, about the family service, about the midweek uh, too, about the things we do to try and seek to welcome people in. Circuit's just gone. Yeah, it's that. Do you need to go and press the button? Uh, I don't really want to, if it's going to do this again, because it means we're over the Okay. Well, I want you to do it in a minute, right? I can run that extension you know, I was talking about over there to make sure I don't trip it again. You get me sorted because I want to play a song in two minutes, yeah? <coughs> so people hear me while I'm just talking. So <clears throat> that's happening now, and if you can after the service, that would be great. If you can go down and show your face, even just for an hour, um, to help out. If you've not got some lunch organised, go and find a hot roast or something else that, that is down there. But be part of part of the people to tell people about our wonderful message of Jesus. So this week, and this week I missed one. Sam, do you want to press the button as well? Tom's sorting that out for me. Thanks. So it's prayer meeting, 
I think of Jules, expecting that, good, a nod from Jules. So prayer meeting this week at Jules. It's back to school this week. Now the kids club is on this week at 6.15. We've got a week off rock solid. We're doing planning week and lots of our young people have got exams as well. So we're giving them one extra Wednesday off to do lots of revision. <laughs> That's what he's there for. <laughs> with the busiest salary, happy with me saying that. Go on, That's the one I've missed, Mick. You're on the ball. Brilliant. <laughs> so the one I've missed is midweek at two. So I'm never sure which week it is. I must take one of these cards. So it is midweek at two this week, Mick. And it says children's author Sue Wilkins. So I don't know what sort of book she writes. I know the people that come along find midweek at two really helpful and encouraging. But that's midweek at two this week. And next Sunday, I've got Jeff down to speak, so I've got a second nod in the morning, that's good, and a lunch afterwards, a third nod in the morning. So, I think I've got it right. Now, like the longer term notice, which I wish I had a little bit more information on for you, but I haven't got everything yet, is Real Lives at Stenson, Stenson Christian Fellowship. So some of you will know Stenson Christian Fellowship, it's where Jen Hudson and family, is the church there, part of, from Pine Lake when we go to Pine Lake, which we're hoping to do later in the year, make final arrangements for that. But they have this event every two years called Real Lives. People from all sorts of different walks of life. Local people, there's someone from the military, there's a Hindu who's become a Christian, there's someone who's escaped from North Korea more than once because they got sent back and they escaped again. So that one sounds interesting. There's someone who used to be in the ultra voluntary defence force or something. Not the IRA, the Protestant side of it. But they've got a bunch of great people. I just don't know which days people are coming. And it's not on the website yet. I think it's a 7 or 7.30, but I'm not even sure of the time. But if you've got someone, maybe someone who came to one of, the, one of the baptisms recently or one of the weddings or just a friend, people, the mums from um, kids clubs, but if you've got people, it's the perfect thing to bring them along to, to find out about what real faith in Jesus can make as a difference in their lives. We see it in the family service all the time. This is just a little bit special. So if you've got people you want to take along, please do that. And when I get more details, I'll let you have them. Okay. Thanks, Sam. So we are going to head into communion. And I wanted to play a song to settle our hearts in communion. We'll sing it together, but we can stay seated. The question now is, is Tom ready? Yeah, one minute, I'm just... That's on a different circuit. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. So I played this before. I love this song. This is this is quite a new song. It's by Matt. Um, I played it once, we sung it once. It's really quiet, so you get a chance to stand up again after communion before we get into the message. But we're going to sing it together, um, just to quieten our hearts, and it's the song King of Calvary. So hopefully Thomas has got some sound back. Should I forget? The kindness of your heart Should I forget How beautiful your grace Oh lead me to That old and rugged cross And let these eyes Be open once again Should I look up And see those healing wounds be unaffected by this mystery Oh, wash me now beneath that crimson flow Let me behold the King of Calvary Hear every drop of blood says I am loved and Mercy reaches out for me Let every grateful breath Cry hallelujah to the King of Calvary Blood that 
flow will never lose its power. This cross of Christ forever stands to say that we have been adopted into love and rescued by the King of Calvary. Oh, praise His name, this King who died for me. Here every drop of blood says I am loved and mercy reaches out for me. Let every grateful breath cry hallelujah to the King. To arrive in paradise one day And see in full as I am fully seen Oh, what a grace forever to behold The Lamb of God, my King of Calvary Oh, praise His name this king who died for me this king who died for me this king who died for me Jesus, we confess that too often we come, and as we've just sung, we are unaffected. Open our eyes now, as we stand again at the cross, as we look up and see you there, wounded for our transgressions, bruised and stricken and afflicted for us, so that with your stripes we are healed. Lord Jesus, help us to stay. Help us to stay for more than a glimpse. John the Baptist, earlier at the start of your ministry, cried out to those who would listen, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And Lord Jesus, we're encouraged to fix our eyes on you. Help us just to do that for a few moments now through the eyes of our hearts, as well as the thoughts in our minds. Just to humbly come, and to know that here we find love, we find mercy, we find unimaginable, infinite and immense grace to cover our sins so that we could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, your body that was given and broken for us, your perfect life that was laid down. We just simply want to seek to remember you, and to worship you and this special way that you set aside for your disciples and your church to take this bread together to speak of our oneness together and our oneness with you for all that you are your wonderful person and all that you've done for us help us now to bring in return something of the love of our hearts for the great love that you've shown us we pray we ask you, Lord Jesus, for your glory, because we simply seek to do what you've asked us to do, together now, in Jesus' name. Amen.
we're going to pray for the cup as we normally do. Just hold on to it and we'll drink it one together when we give them thanks. Loving Father, we can't imagine what it cost you. As your word tells us that you didn't spare your own son, but you gave him up freely for us all. As we look at the cross, it's, it's not easy for us to see the sorrow of your son, the abandoned cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And sometimes we sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that you should give your only son to make us, the wretch, your treasure. And Father, we thank you that you have given up your son for us, for that only time ever in all of time and eternity, that that triune God, that wonderful fellowship had to be broken, because there you poured out all of the divine and righteous wrath and judgment on sin, our sin, our shame, our greed, our lust, our lies. Lord Jesus, all laid on you. Father, all laid on your son. Lord Jesus, we wonder at your obedience. We stretch back just earlier into the night and hear your prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. Obedient even unto death. To the pouring out of your lifeblood for the forgiveness and remission of sins. So Lord Jesus, we take now this cup. We remember your blood that was shed so that we could be forgiven. And we thank you that you, the King of Calvary, are the one who died for us, in our place, in our stead, in that great love. We remember you now, we worship you now. We want to bring you glory and honour until that day comes when in paradise we will stand before you and know face to face as you know us, the intimacy that you want with us fulfilled. And so we remember you now, we take this bread, we now take this wine one more time, Lord Jesus, until you come back. Bless us now, we pray, and bring glory and honour to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. remember our Lord together. We're going to see again in just a second, but one of the things about walking around is I get to occasionally whisper something under my breath to people. I've just been around and I've had a prick of conscience as I've shared the bread and wine with Gladys because I didn't pray for Julian. So I'm going to pray for Julian now and then I'm going to see again. Father, we thank you for Gladys, for Sharina, for Luke, and for Julia. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for the joy that it brings us to have them as part of this church. We thank you for Sharina and all the blessings that you've given her in her studies in Cambridge and to see her walk following you. And we pray for Julia. You know his heart, you know his mind, you know his struggles, you know his needs. And we pray that you would help him and the family pray that you bring the relief that he needs. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask this for your glory, that you would help them and show them your grace today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. 
So we're going to sing one more song and then we'll use the rest of the time just to share something with you. So here's a perfect hymn for today. You can almost sing this hymn every week. It's a Getty hymn. I think we know it well enough. I'm going to play it on the piano. Buff and Anna are going to come and lead with us. And it's Speak, O Lord. It's a lovely, lovely song. But yeah, stand up for this one and stretch.
And we went through this, and we went looking at the teaching church, the loving church, the worshipping church. And the idea wasn't to try and say, what do we want our church to look like? It was to say, what does God want our church to look like? We called it Church as God Intended. And that might sound a bit pretentious. Who are we to know exactly how church is how God intends it? But it's our attempt in that time, and I want to revisit this, as we've got a wonderful group of people in our church, what is it God would like our church to look like? And I feel that's a good thing for us to revisit. But those who will remember the chart will know there's something missing. Now Tom's got the answer because he always has. Can you see the next slide? Anyone remember what's missing? Or should I help you? Who's missing from that chart? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Go on Tom. Let's be the next one. That's the key to everything. So that's where we're going to finish in 20 minutes or so. Jesus is the key. Of course Jesus is the head of the church. So I'm going to start with the teaching church. And as I was looking back over this and thinking about it, I thought, well, were we right to call it the teaching church? Do you want to move on, Tom? Thanks. Then I thought, maybe I should call this talk the learning church. Because teaching's no good if we're not learning, is it? We go to school and we listen to our teachers and we don't pay any attention, we don't really learn a lot. We're here to learn. Then I started thinking about, well, is that enough? We don't learn from God in his presence, from the Holy Spirit, and from his word unless we're submissive. We come in submission to our Lord Jesus and to his word. And then we don't really learn unless we're obedient. So there are four little things I'm going to run through quickly this morning. The teaching church, the learning church, the submissive church, and the obedient church. But first of all, I'm going to read the passage I read last time I spoke, which is a great passage talking about what God's church should be like from Ephesians chapter 4. So I'm just going to read through this wonderful passage that Paul wrote. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, When he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So, first run of this, the teaching church. So we read at the start in Acts chapter 2, the day the church was born, we read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. So I think there's an important question right at the start. The Holy Spirit has come, Peter has preached, a few thousand people have been saved, 
when the church has come together. And already on day one, the summary Luke gives us is they devoted themselves to the Apostles' Doctrine. So what was the Apostles' Doctrine? None of the New Testament had been written. That's going to fill it out for us. But on day one, they devoted themselves to the Apostles' Doctrine. They had their teacher from Jesus, who of course is the greatest teacher. He's the teacher the church needs as our head. He is the greatest teacher, the one who taught with authority, not as the scribes. If you look back to just before, after the resurrection, there's some interesting things that Luke records for us in Luke 24 and in Acts. In Luke 24, as he meets the two on the Emmaus Road, he tells them that the Messiah should suffer and then enter into glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. When he then appears to the disciples afterwards, he mentions Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, the three categories that the Jews give to split up the Old Testament. So firstly, and perhaps importantly again, it's about Jesus. The Apostles' Doctrine is about Jesus. And just as Luke records it, you get these things through from Luke into Acts. Their doctrine was that there was forgiveness found in Christ through repentance and faith. That Jesus was their Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. This was their doctrine on day one. This is not something that comes in. As people may tell you outside, well, they didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. That came in later. It's mythical. It's legendary. They believed it on day one. Jesus is the Christ. That's what Peter preaches, the Son of God. They went about preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Day one, the resurrection, Jesus is alive. Again, not some myth or legend that's been handed in. They believed Jesus was alive. They'd seen him. They went preaching the good news, the gospel about Jesus, that you could have peace through Jesus, that he was the judge, both of the living and the dead. I've written down on my page here the basics. The basics, the fundamentals of our faith. That's what the Apostles' Doctrine was. It's then filled out wonderfully for all the letters that Peter, James, Paul and others wrote. And we have the whole New Testament now, aren't we blessed? But the simple things that we believe about Jesus, as to who he is, as to what he's done, what he's going to do, that was what they devoted themselves to in the Apostles' Doctrine. 1 Corinthians 15 is very interesting in this context. There's lots of creeds that get repeated in certain churches or in history in churches. And this is probably the first such creed of the church. Because Paul here, writing to Corinth, says, I deliver to you as first of importance what I also received. This is what they had told him. And of course, Paul becomes a Christian very quickly into the New Testament story. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then the Twelve. This repeated creed of the early church, again, is the fundamental truth about who Jesus is, about what he has done. So they devoted themselves to the Apostles' doctrine and to their teaching. And we are to seek to be a teaching church based on God's word and who Jesus is. What about learning though? What about learning? Week by week on a Sunday or if you come on a Tuesday, even to the children, there's so much teaching that is available in our little church. But are we learning? What's the purpose of me, Jeff and Andy particularly, but other people trying to teach? If you look at 2 Timothy, it says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to learn truth, and to make us realise what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The purpose of teaching isn't just so we become clever about the Bible. It's good to know about the Bible, it's good to understand how it fits together, but that's not the thing. It's not an academic knowledge. It's to teach us truth. It's to correct us. And we'll come to that when we talk about submission. It's to teach us to do what's right. It's to equip us. 
In Ephesians 4 that we read, it goes even further. It talks about their responsibility. So there's something particular here for me, Jeff and Andy, and anyone who teaches. It's to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church. What we need to be doing, and I'm sure we try in God's grace and help to do, is to equip, to encourage, to build up. But what's this equipping for? It's so we can do the good works of God. It's so we can become like Jesus. This teaching is going to continue until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord. The purpose God has in our lives is to make us mature in like Christ. And to do that, he needs to teach us. And we need to learn. I've got a little summary for this bit. So the teaching and learning church, it corrects. We don't like that, do we? Ever since we've been old enough to say no, or remember saying no, we've not liked being corrected. I didn't like it when my mum and dad would correct me. It's not fun for children, younger, older, when mum or dad has to try and correct. And sometimes as parents get it wrong, don't we? I'm all self-justified when someone tries to correct me. That's my natural reaction, self-justification. There's other reactions you can have, denial, blame shifting. There's all sorts of tricks our old human nature places. But in the church, the Holy Spirit, through his word, Jesus wants to correct us. He wants to transform our behaviour. As we said, he wants to equip us to do good work. He wants to build us up and encourage us. He wants us to produce maturity, or him to produce maturity in us, to be like Christ. I don't really realise this. I don't know why. What's the primary reason you come along and be part of our church? Because there's lots of reasons we're part of the church. Can I just put this one forward this morning? We come to the church so we can change. We come to the church so that all of the things that I have, anger, lust, greed, shame, lies, whatever it is, so God can transform my character. We come so that through the good news of the gospel we can receive forgiveness of sins through that repentance and faith that they taught about. But that's the start, that's new birth, and we come so that we can experience new life and become more like Christ. We come to the church to change. But we need to come with a submissive heart. It's starting to get a little bit closer to home now. It's okay to talk about teaching. It's okay to talk about learning. In all aspects of life, we teach and learn. Now it's getting hard. Pride's going to get in the way if we're not careful. The submissive church. Now, <clears throat> Some people might know, and the answer is the answer's not allowed to be Jesus for once, okay? <coughs> Have you got a favourite character in the Bible? Anyone got a favourite character in the Bible? Jeff? David. David. That's a good answer, isn't it? Anyone know what mine is? If I'm not allowed to say Jesus. I've mentioned it before, but like I've said, us preachers like to think you remember every word we ever tell you, and of course you don't. Well, not Paul, although I like Paul. <coughs> My favourite hero, if I can call him the Old Testament, is a king called Josiah. Now, the danger is, I'm going to need to have a bit of time doing this, but I want to tell you about Josiah because of his submission. Josiah became king when he was eight. <coughs> his father, Amon, had been king for two years and he'd been killed, he'd been murdered. And he's eight. His grandfather was Manasseh, one of the most evil kings Judah had ever had. Got sent away, but then he repented. There was terrible things going on. In the eighth year of his reign, he seeks the God of his father David. In the twelfth year of his reign, so he's twenty now, he starts to tear down the altars and the idols. In the eighteenth year of his reign, at twenty-six, he repairs the temple. And this is what happens. They go, and I'm going to skip read this a bit, you can see it, but they go to the temple and they find the book of the Lord Moses. They lost it. And then, Shaphan, this man, he brings it to the king and he reads it. And he says, when the king heard the words of the Lord, he tore his robes. That was his attitude to reading what he had heard. 
And he realised that God's judgement was going to come because of the continued disobedience of the, of the nation. He then goes and asks them to speak to this prophetess, this lady holder, who is there in Jerusalem. So they go off and they speak to her. And she answers, this is what the Lord God of Israel says, tell the man who sent you to me that he is going to bring disaster. The judgment is set. It's not many years afterwards that Babylon comes and the exile starts. The judgment is set. But then she carries on. Tell the king of Judah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the words you have heard. So do you want to find the one with the underlining on Tom? Brilliant. Because your heart was responsive. And you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and his people. And because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. And Josiah has promised peace. Judah was in a terrible place. And this eight-year-old boy who'd lost his father through murder and seeking God they find the book. This is his response. And they have such a revival. They have the Passover for the first time in how many years? The best Passover since Samuel. And this is the epitaph of Josiah. It says, Never, neither before or after him was a king who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, in accordance with all the laws of Moses. No king. David's great, but this verse is putting him above David. It's putting him above Solomon. It's putting him above Hezekiah. <coughs> There's something familiar that you recognise in that. He did it with all his heart, all his soul, all his strength. Does that sound familiar? Where do you recognise that from? Jesus makes this clear to, the, to Satan in the temptation. And it's from Deuteronomy 6. It's, Lord our God is one, love him with all your soul, heart. It's the greatest commandment. Josiah put himself to it. And how? Because he was submissive. I, as much as he's my hero in the Bible, I'm not like that. Are we like that when we come and God cuts us and corrects us? Are we like that? <coughs> <laughs> to my shame, I'm not. Not very often. I want to come to Jesus just quickly, and then we've got our last section. This is how Jesus describes himself, because ultimately Jesus is the head, he's in the middle. I want all of this to focus our eyes to Jesus. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, I am humble in heart. What's the purpose of teaching in the church? It's to make us like Christ. Christ was the one who humbled himself, went to a cross. The only time he describes his heart, he says, I'm gentle and humble. There's more to being a Christian than being gentle and humble. But you can tell me afterwards, and correct me if I need it, but I hope I'm becoming more gentle and humble because then I'm becoming more like Christ. Rather more hard or judgmental or whatever else is against it. It's Christ that we need to know. It's his heart. That's the goal of learning and it won't come unless we're submissive. It won't come unless we're submissive. And that's tough. We needed to come in repentance and submission when we found faith in Christ and salvation in Christ. But as Christians, that doesn't mean repentance is done. The transformation process is still a process of repentance and faith. Let's come to obedience to finish. Jesus is the perfect example as always here. He was obedient unto death. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. We mentioned Gethsemane. When he puts himself to do his Father's will and to accept the cup. In Psalm 2, quoted in Hebrews 10, it says of Jesus, the Son of God who would come. 
that he delighted to do his father's will. This is what it says about Ezra. I don't know the last time anyone preached on Ezra, but Ezra, of course, is the priest who, after the judgment and the exile of the 70 years in Babylon, Ezra's the priest who comes back with the people and then teaches them and they set up the temple again. And it says here, why was Ezra's mission back successful? Why was it successful? It was because Ezra determined to study and obey the law of the Lord. Those of us who love our Bibles and seek to learn it and teach from it, it's like those of us who stand up here. It's not enough just to be determined to study it and teach it. This is a real challenge and he's down the park, you may watch it on the video later for me and Jeff. To study and obey. Don't need to say much more than that. But that's what it says. We're to study and obey. Looking at Jesus again, the centre of what we're talking about. Luke is so diligent, but right at the start of his second book, the book of Acts, he said that he wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The doing comes before the teaching when it comes to Jesus. That's why his teaching was so impactful, why it was so authoritative, because it wasn't like the scribes. The scribes, Jesus said, they were teaching one thing and doing another thing. That's why he calls them hypocrites. Jesus was completely consistent. He's our head, he's the true vine, he's the one that this needs to come and focus on. There's a verse from James coming up which I'm going to touch on because I want to get to the key and to finish. If you've read James, you know James is blunt. But how many times do we come on a Sunday not with a submissive heart, or to our daily reading and not with a submissive heart, and we go, well that was interesting, and then we just walk off. James has some harsh words to say about that. We must do what it said. Otherwise our teaching is in vain, it won't equip, it won't build up. It won't grow us and our church. So what's the key to all of this? I finished with this last time, didn't I, as well. What's the key? Who's the key? The key's the Lord in the middle. The Lord in the centre. The Lord in a preeminent place. Jesus, our role to teach, in one sense, is to so fill our eyes of our minds and our hearts, our mind and our strength, our soul, with the magnificence and the power and the holiness and glory of Jesus, to make him so beautiful and lovely before us, in his wisdom, in his grace, in his mercy, in his brightness, his majesty, so beautiful to us, as our head, that our love grows. In John 14 it says, It is whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And if I'm not submissive and learning, if I reverse that, it's probably because I don't love Jesus as much as I should. And why would that be? Because, or for all of us, because I'm failing, God in me isn't failing, but I'm failing to let God present to you the magnificence of Christ. If we see the magnificence of Christ, if I grasp it, my love will grow, my submissiveness will grow, my learning will grow, and I will become more like him. And the key to this is that, and the Holy Spirit, because it's the advocate, the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, who has been sent, who is going to teach us all things. We're doing a study on the Holy Spirit on the Tuesdays. So that was a little quick, and I want us to listen to one song to finish. But what a question. It's easy to be the teaching church. It's a little bit harder to be the learning church. Maybe we need to confess and repent. We need to be submissive. We need to be obedient. We need to see the magnificence of Christ and love him again. The song we're going to play after I pray is a little bit about coming back to that love. But we're going to pray now and then God bless us we'll ask. Lord Jesus, your word is powerful. It's true. It's there to correct and equip and to build up and encourage it. 
through your Holy Spirit, you're able to talk to each one of our minds and hearts. And we do confess, so often we come on a Sunday or on a Tuesday or to our Bible when we read it at home, and it feels perhaps a little bit like a chore or just another thing on our to-do list to do. And we rush off and we don't listen and we commit the sin that James is talking about. And we go away unchanged and unaltered. Help us to listen to the Holy Spirit's whisper. Help us to spend the time, Lord Jesus, with you to learn more of your lowliness and gentleness, your magnificence and beauty, that you might become more beautiful to us. That like Josiah, we might be known as people and a church together who have turned to you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Bless us each one, we pray. Encourage us, we ask. Encourage us in the time this afternoon at Chapar that people might be reached and affected and want to come and learn more about you because you're so lovely and wonderful. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Take us back The place we begin The simple pursuit Of nothing but you The innocence of Heart in your hands God take us back Oh God take us back To an unswerving faith In the power of your name A heart beating for Your kingdom to reign A church that is known for your presence again and God take us back Nothing and no one comes close to you Nothing could ever come close Nothing and no one It's you and you only Nothing could ever So keep our hearts real And keep your grace close You're bringing us back You're bringing us home To an unswerving faith In the power of a name A heart beating for your King Church that is known for your presence again. God, take us back. 
to reign. A church that is known for your presence again.